Dark Souls is a series renowned for its environmental storytelling, mysterious characters and obscure lore. We're going to talk about an iceberg covering all three games. Now, these entries came from various sources including the Dark Souls artworks, art books and icebergs on Reddit by various people who, and uh, apologies if I mispronounce any usernames, but these are by Scantia, PTS4815, The Backgrounder, The Julianic, Misfit, 597, Kevin's, and a massive shout out to YouTuber Nat is Cool who has done icebergs on each game and the whole trilogy as well. Sources will also be linked in the description below too. As it's been a while since my last iceberg video, for those who don't know, icebergs are a collection of facts, theories, and trivia organized at the most well known at the top and getting darker and more obscure as we go. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The Blight Town Wheel Dog. There's a dog running in a big hamster wheel keeping the mechanism that takes you to the bottom working in Blight Town. And uh, it's just really, really funny, to be honest. I love this little guy. Great Hollow Falling Basilisk. There's a basilisk that spawns out of bounds when you enter the Great Hollow, leading to a free 400 souls every time you load into the area. Duke's Archives Whispers. As part of the ambient audio for the Duke's Archives, you can hear indistinct whispers all around the area, and I like to imagine that it's all the collected knowledge seeping out of the library, and it's possibly what corrupted Seath further to become as cruel and twisted as we see him in-game. So Lair is the Cartha Sandworm. What, because it can use lightning? That, that means it's Solaire. Nah, man. To, to humour this, I think the theory is that the sunlight maggot that attached to Solaire matured into this thing, but even that doesn't make sense to me, as the creature probably would have died with him when he was killed, and we know that it's canon that you went back to his own world to link the fire anyway. Uh, this entry is just kind of a meme at this point. Aiming with binoculars. You can use the binoculars item to centre a target with a crossbow or with projectile spell, so that's pretty cool. I had no idea you could do this till researching for this iceberg. Oscar and Shiva's Cut Quest As the name of the entry suggests, these two had cut quest lines. Shiva's was less involved, his quest was more or less a retread of Satsuki from Demon Souls, appearing friendly but wanting the Chaos Blade from you if you have it, killing you if you refuse or when you hand it over, but you could invade him in the Painted World to get it back. Oscar was going to be far more directly involved with the Chosen and Dead story, however, and was going to show up across the whole game at various points, ending with a battle at the Kiln of the First Flame, siding with the Primordial Serpent that you didn't. Send Gate Skip this is very much a speedrun tactic. Uh, by parrying an enemy at a particular spot above Andre's area, the camera will switch to an odd angle, allowing you to skip through most of Sen's fortress. I've never tried doing this myself, as it is a little bit complicated, but it allows you to skip pretty much all of Sen's fortress, and it means you don't have to open up the gate. Killing bosses outside of the arenas. This is a cheesy little tactic that's been possible since Demon Souls, particularly with the Man Eaters, and it continues with bosses such as Sif and the Capra Demon, just to name a couple. Basilisks have tiny eyes. Yep, the big circles aren't the eyes, they actually have tiny beady eyes right under them. Uh, I think this is basically like a defense mechanism they have, like a lot of animals in the real world do, where they have exaggerated body features in order to ward off predators in their environment, and I think it's really cool that they added this little feature to the basilisks. Cut lower undead berg shortcut. I genuinely can't find anything on this. I was going to cut it from the video, but I, I had to include it since it was in pretty much every iceberg I found relating to Dark Souls 1. The only thing I can think of is maybe the the bars were meant to not be there and connect back to the upper undead berg or something, or maybe somewhere in the Capra Demons area was meant to get you back to Filing Shrine or something. I don't know. Someone please explain this in the comments. I am begging. Petrus is a traitor. He's a nasty piece of work. He deliberately had Rhea and her guards go down to the Tomb of the Giants in order to leave them to die. And if you rescue Rhea and leave him alone, he'll just kill her at some point. Undead King Jareel. 
a cut boss for the new London Ruins. He shares the exact same attack animations and moveset as False King Alan from Demon Souls. I believe you were meant to kill him to gain access to the key to the seal, as cut voice lines from Ingwood imply. It would have been really interesting to see either a prototype version of a Dark Wraith or a high-ranking member of a Dark Wraith aside from the normal enemies that you see in-game, and having another boss for the new Londor Ruins other than the Four Kings as well, but seems that Jariel wasn't meant to be. Humanity are pieces of the Dark Soul the furtive pygmy in a sense passed tiny shards of the Dark Soul down to humanity, not literally, but I guess that's just like a particular power that humans have, to gain access to a tiny bit of power from the Dark Soul itself, similar to how Gwyn fragments his soul and hands it to people of importance. Age of Dark Ending I think this is just referring to the fact that you can become the Dark Lord and start this age in Dark Souls 1, but there's also two Dark Lord-esque endings in Dark Souls 3 as well. One where you side with Yuria and become the Lord of Hollows, and the one where you kill the Firekeeper and keep all of the power from the First Flame and her to yourself. I don't count the Betrayal ending as an Age of Dark ending because it feels a little bit different from the others, but I guess it technically still is as well. Sif's Alternative Cutscene if you complete the Artorius of the Abyss DLC before fighting Sif in the base game, a slightly different cutscene plays where it's clear that they recognise you, sniffing you and then howling sadly before the battle begins. Smoke kills Ornstein. This refers to the cutscene in the ONS fight after beating one. If Samoa is beaten first, Ornstein respectfully places his hand on his chest before absorbing his power. If Ornstein dies first, however, Smoke bonks him. However, although it's very hard to spot, you can see Ornstein's fingers twitch ever so slightly before he's hit, meaning that he was still alive and Smoke was actually the one to do him in purely for the sake of power. Two Sanctuary Guardians. So I actually didn't know this, but after killing Artorius, there'll be two lesser Sanctuary Guardians in the original Guardians boss arena. That's wild to me. It's probably so you have a better chance of getting their exclusive item uh, by cutting the tail, but uh, yeah, I didn't know that you could fight two little Sanctuary Guardians after killing the main one and killing Artorius. It's crazy. Critical Item Chest. I think this is referring to the treasure chest that's behind Framped. If you throw important items away, like let's say the Lord Vessel for example, it'll reappear in this chest. It's pretty cool. Using the Four Kings Sword You were originally intended to be able to get the same sword that the Four Kings use as an ultra great sword boss weapon in the game, but this was unfortunately cut for the final release. Ash Lake Hydra Jump when fighting the Hydra in Ash Lake, if you run to the other side, it'll do a huge leap to chase after you and continue its attack on the other side. It's always a really cool visual in my opinion. The Iron Golem is made from Dragon Bone. The core of the Iron Golem was created by the gods when they fused together ancient dragon bones with the power of a soul. Without its core, uh, the Iron Golem would just be a hunk of armor and it wouldn't be able to be used as a proving method for Knights of Gwyn's army. The Nameless King is Faram. Both beings are known as the God of War. In Dark Souls 2, the Lion Clan, being mostly associated with Faram, was said to appear very suddenly, so perhaps after being exiled, the Nameless King arrived in an unknown region with a new name, and then later went to live the rest of his days with the Stormdrake that we see in Dark Souls 3. Praise the Sun. The gesture most famously tied with Solaire in the Sunbro Covenant, it was tucked away in Demon Souls as a higher up told Miyazaki to get rid of it and the pose looked dumb, but he personally really liked it so it was hidden away and it became hugely associated with Dark Souls and Solaire in particular, seeing as it's the pose he always makes when you summon him into your world. Fake Moonlight Greatsword in Dark Souls 2 Bernhardt of Jugon is seen with what looks like the Moonlight Greatsword, but when finishing his quest, he gives you his weapon, and he always talks about how it has some sort of special power uh, that comes from his bloodline, and he needs to prove himself to wield it. But as it turns out, this is a fake. 
the real Moonlight Greatsword is made out of a boss weapon. He is carrying just a normal greatsword with a Moonlight Greatsword coat of paint over it. Three pigs. I think this is talking about the three pigs in Majula, like right outside the abandoned mansion. Uh, the only thing I can think of as to why they're on the iceberg is, I think each time you kill them, they get slightly bigger. And other than that, they're really, really scary. I don't like him. Uh. Molin Cockiness. When you first meet him, he comes across as a bit meek, but overall a pretty nice dude. But the more you buy from him, and when you buy a significant amount from him, and he gets a certain amount of souls, he becomes a right asshole. Not a fan of the guy. Broken Sainter's Spear. In contrast to most weapons, breaking the Sainter's Spear in Dark Souls 2 is actually pretty beneficial. It changes the moveset to a mixture of Twin Blade, Halberd, Falchion, and Spear movesets, and this is really unique. I can't think of any other weapon that works like this in the whole franchise, honestly. Ceaseless Discharge, Easy Kill. Something pretty much anyone who's played Dark Souls 1 knows, when activating the fight, running to the fog gate will cause Ceaseless to jump and hold on to the edge. Hitting him once will cause him to fall and die almost instantly. Majestic Greatsword, left-handed. This is in reference to the item description of the sword in Dark Souls 2, reading, An ancient greatsword of unknown origin. This sword was passed down through generations until it reached Gordon, wandering knight of Ferosa, and was lost upon his death. Uncannily, every last one of the prominent swordsmen who inherited this weapon was left-handed. This is most likely a callback to Artorias' fighting style in his fight in Dark Souls 1's DLC. Orange Sky after Yorman Aldridge Potentially being a carryover from Bloodborne, the sky everywhere except I believe Irithyll and Archdragon Peak become orange and the sun becomes an eclipse, specifically being the dark sign after slaying all Lords of Cinder besides the Twin Princes. And I wish this did a little bit more in the actual game world. I know it didn't do a ton in Bloodborne, but it did signal kind of the progression of gameplay and it did change up enemies as kind of the night progressed. And like I say, I just wish they did a little bit more with this concept. It could have been really cool to see slightly changed enemies as the game goes on or like a mix up of enemy placement. Just something small to keep things fresh, you know? The Nameless Usurper is Lysia. A woman who you meet at the end of Hyde's Tower of Flame, Lysia appears to be nothing more than Dark Souls 2 Miracle Vendor. However, there are a few hints that she has a more darker nature, specifically a greed for souls. The Nameless Usurper is a red phantom who invades the player at multiple points in game, who wears the exact same outfit as her, and if Lysia is killed, the Usurper will never invade you. That, to me, being pretty much concrete proof that they are the same person. Pisakas are kidnapped women. This is just a very disturbing fact. Seath is known for the kidnapping of maidens and human experimentation. Two particular Pisakas also drop miracles associated with Guinevere, implying that they're handmaidens or servants of hers, and by extension, all Pisakas are scared, transformed women broken beyond repair. Now that that's all of layer 1 covered, it's time to get into the second. Andre Scrapped Origins He was originally intended to be the son of Gwyn, the exiled firstborn, and he'd originally push a statue to open the kiln from Firelink Shrine for you. Unused Bear Armor slash Bear Warrior character There's cut armor in Dark Souls 1 that very much looks like it's made from bear skin, Honestly, I wish they kept this for, like, maybe the Deprived class. It would have really gone into the caveman vibe they've got going on. You know. Animal skin for clothes. Club. Me hit. Ungie bungie. <laughs> Infinite soft humanity glitch. There was a bug that allowed you to have unlimited soft humanity, i.e. the number at the top left of the screen rather than the actual item, which is referred to as hard humanity. There's an infinite souls glitch too. Skeletons drop no souls. Yeah, since they're constantly being reanimated by necromancers, they don't have an independent soul to drop in Dark Souls 1 anyway. I believe that they do drop souls in Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3, since 
the skeletons work differently in those two games rather than the first one. Dragon Butt's huge aggro range. In the original game, the range these enemies will trigger to attack is about three quarters of the area they actually reside in. Thank god that the range was greatly reduced in the remaster though. Halberd Sweet Spots Hitting enemies with the tip of the halberd will deal additional damage. Now, this isn't the worst thing to do in Dark Souls 1 or 3, but due to the changes to the moveset in Dark Souls 2, it really gutted their viability in that game, which is why they're on the iceberg. Jeremiah is the parasitic wall hugger. In Blight Town, you come across a demon stuck to the wall. In the files, it's known as Prince Isolith, as in the son of the king of Isolith and the Witch of Isolith. So this leaves the identity of the wall hugger either being one of two people. It could be Xanthus King Jeremiah himself, as in the art book it does state that the big cone scarf that he has is covering up a demonic parasite, or that Jeremiah is the king of Isolith and this is him and the witch's son. Could be called Jeremiah Jr. Who knows? Artorius and Quailag cut dialogue. Before fighting him, Artorius had cut lines of him, essentially losing his mind and hallucinating. Quailag, on the other hand, seems to have had her own covenant, which wouldn't really have worked if she was a required boss unless she was originally the leader of the Chaos Covenant and then once you kill her, the Fair Lady runs it, but if it's her own thing, then yeah, it wouldn't have worked if she's a required boss, because you'd have to kill your Covenant leader. Doesn't, it seems a bit counterintuitive, so it's probably for the best that it was cut. Ornstein is an illusion. With the old Dragon Slayer in Dark Souls 2 and the theory that Ornstein is the Storm Drake in Dark Souls 3, uh, something which we'll get into further down in the iceberg later, and Smo's item description in the same game, it's highly debated if Ornstein already left by the time the Chosen Undead arrived, and the Ornstein we fight is an illusion made by Gwendolyn. I personally believe this theory is true, and the Ornstein we fight is an illusion created by him. Poop walking. Really funny name aside, because poop. Come on, poo poo funny. This is actually a speedrunning strategy. Uh, I'm I'm dead serious. As I'm not much of a speedrunner, I'm gonna quote the Speed Souls wiki. Uh, so it states verbatim. Poop walking is a glitch in Dark Souls with the animation blending system, which effectively halves the distance travelled during all animations, but not their speed. The only known method of triggering poop walk at the moment is to cause a player to T-pose just as they transition from some action animation back to the idle pose. In order to T-pose at will, you must hold an invalid item in your right hand. And in order to acquire an invalid item, you must utilize Dark Souls Equip Slot Manipulation. Use ESM to equip any item that does not correspond to a weapon ID. When holding it, you should see an empty ammo indicator on the hood. Once holding it, parrying will T-pose you momentarily. Kalamit is not a Cyclops. Although his middle eye is most prominent and probably one of the most striking things about his design, he does actually have two much smaller eyes on either side. Which I didn't know, I really did think he just had the big eye in the middle and he was just a cyclops. But uh, yeah, looking at the model, he does have two little tiny beady eyes. Kinda reminds me of the Basilisk now I think about it. Havel is not the person in the tower. This is covered in much more depth by the YouTuber Hawkshaw, but to be brief, there's a theory that the person trapped in the tower next to Darkrue is actually just a devout follower of Havel, but not Havel himself, either being mistaken or being used as some sort of decoy, being the more likely reason as to why he's imprisoned. Vagrants Similar to creatures that are found in Demon Souls, these tiny crab-like enemies appear when you die with large amounts of humanity, but they are still quite rare. I mean, I've played Dark Souls 1, I want to say about five times, and I've only ever come across vagrants a handful of times across all playthroughs. Manus is the Furt of Pygmy a popular theory is that Manus is indeed the third of Pygmy, with him being so powerful and being able to use unique magic. It was very possible that the original intention was for him to be the third of Pygmy, corrupted by the Abyss and his own anger for his pendant being stolen. 
I do fully believe that is what they were going with when Manus was created. However, I think Dark Souls 3 has since retconned this idea. Nito's Grab. Gravelord Nito has an incredibly rare grab attack that he can use in his boss fight, and I had to include this in at least layer 2 of the iceberg because I had no idea that this was an attack he could do until researching. Despawned Hellkite Drake. I think this is in reference to an incredibly rare glitch. The only thing that I could really find was a couple of Reddit threads saying that when they went to the bridge he's usually encountered in, he just did not appear at all, even though they didn't kill him. Uh, but going away and going back to the original encounter area is supposed to fix the issue. Kareem is Yarnum. I think people might believe this due to Marvelous Chester being from there, but I think that's the only possible link. It's the only one I was able to find anyway. All of the other characters stated to be from Kareem are consistent with the armor or dress sense of Dark Souls' as world, so in my view that does debunk the idea. Voices in Pinwheel's theme. As part of Pinwheel's theme, there are whispering voices all throughout it, and I love this effect, but I'm not sure it's ever definitively been proven what's being said. I've heard some people say it sounds like there are little thing phrases like I'm sorry or it hurts, but I think that's people just kind of making out what they want to hear because of Pinwheel's lore and it being creepy, but I do like to imagine in canon that it's all the people who make up Pinwheel speaking with each other, but until we get the full like isolated audio uh, and like for it to be clear what it says, I'm not going to believe anything that's posted online about it personally. Crestfallen Merchant is floating. To give him a bit of a taller appearance, he's floating slightly off the ground. It's a lot easier to notice if you break the furniture that's nearby him, but I just think it's a funny little workaround that they use to give the merchant a little bit of a more unique appearance and to make him a little bit more distinct from other NPCs or the chosen undead. Artorius' dominant arm is broken. Yes, he broke it protecting Sif and battling with the Abyss and Manus, it's easy to tell since his arm can be seen dangling in the cutscene, meaning the man is unintentionally flexing on us by fighting us with his non-dominant arm. Patches is the third of Pygmy. Whilst I don't believe this for a second, there are a few points arguing for this to be the case. Uh, to quote a Reddit comment, he is one of the few characters who survived all Hollow Outbreaks. Patches has a unique and ancient face similar to the third of Pygmy and the humans in the intro, particularly with their baldness and Patches being bald as well. His armour description tells us that it is made to hide furtively in the shadows, and the heavy armour that he uses later says the same about hiding the wearer, making connections with the third of Pygmy's nature. He hates the gods because they erased his name and importance from history and have stolen his humans' love and attention. He blames clerics because they praise and admire the old gods but have forgotten about their true creator, i.e. the third of Pygmy. He himself has no interests or specific wishes, which matches the third of Pygmy's nature because he shares his soul with humans, getting weaker in both size and power, in contrast to the other gods that didn't really share their souls or power to the degree that the third of Pygmy did. He calls you son after recovering his memory in the Ring City, meaning that you share his blood or soul. So he could be saying son in like a, like a biblical sense, like he is the Holy Father for the humans. And after he disappears and potentially goes hollow after defeating Half-Light and, and destroying the last influence of the gods that's kept in the world, which is fulfilling his wish of revenge against the old gods. Patches likes people who like to share, similar to the third of Pygmy sharing his power, an example being that he saves Grey Rat. And he often sells coins, luck-based items, and infinite dark pine resins, which are dark-related items, like humanity's Age of Dark. And some little tangential things that link him to the Furt of Pygmy is that obviously he's still alive at the end of the world at the Dreg Heap. And the Pygmy in the statue where you get the Chloranthi Ring plus three is making a pose that's kind of similar with the Patches squat. I think it's more just him on his knees like begging or, or thanking Gwyn rather than him doing a Patches squat. And the most concrete evidence to this airtight theory Patches starts with a P. Pygmy starts with a P. Coincidence? Like shit, it's a coincidence. Patches is the furtive pygmy confirmed. No, I, I 
don't think he is. Although there are a few good points towards this theory, uh, I think it's more coincidental than anything. Tree jump. Just outside of Firelink in Dark Souls 3, you can get to the roof early if you just jump at the right angle on a fallen tree. It's a bit tricky to do, but after a few tries, you'll manage. Heineken in Dark Souls 2. Uh, yeah, as part of the rubbish and dirt that make up the textures in the Grave of Saints, you can actually find Heineken bottles inside. I think there's also another area in the game that has, like, car parts, so these were obviously just taken off of the internet and, like, not tested to make sure that it fits in the Dark Souls world, but the implication that Heineken exists in, in the Dark Souls series is kind of hilarious. <laughs> The Old Dragon Slayer's Identity Whilst I personally don't believe this, there are a few things pointing to the possibility that the Old Dragon Slayer is some form of Ornstein, so let's go through a few now. It could be possible that the Old Dragon Slayer is some sort of reincarnation of Ornstein's soul, which was gifted to him and the Four Kings by Gwyn that the old dragon slayer doesn't really appear to be as agile as Ornstein was. He does the original charge at you when you first enter his battle arena, but he never does this move again. Gravelord Nito and the Rotten are thematically similar, in the sense that they are both amalgamations of bodies, and the Rotten is confirmed to be a reincarnation of Nito, meaning that it is pretty likely that the old dragon slayer could be a reincarnation of Ornstein's soul. Almost everything about him is described as old, um, from his name to the ring he drops being the old Leo ring, and in Dark Souls 2, all souls of Gwyn, Nido, Isolith, and Seath are all classed as old, but it just doesn't reference their name directly. The boss item from the old Dragon Slayer soul creates Ornstein's Dragon Slayer spear, giving further credence to the idea that the old Dragon Slayer is Ornstein but fallen to an Age of Dark or having taken on some sort of new form. And lastly are the thematic similarities, such as him guarding a cathedral just like Ornstein did, and the speculation that he was guarding potentially Guinevere or whoever lived in Hyde's Tower of Flame before they left, and he either lost track of them and lost his purpose in life, or they died or left him, and that left him sort of lost with no place to go, and thus he fell to the dark instead of using lightning attacks like he did in Dark Souls 1. But is he real? Is he the reincarnated version of Ornstein? Is it his soul? Is it just a random cosplayer who likes him a whole bunch? Who knows? I honestly think it's the latter, but who can really say? Nishandra is a daughter of Manus. Born from the dark after the chosen undead defeated Manus, his soul separated into four beings, specifically being Elana, Olsana, Nadalia, and Nishandra. She's the weakest of all, and thus she coveted power more than most, leading to the events of Dark Souls 2. Pate is the killer. One of the most interesting character stories in Dark Souls 2 is between Pate and Creighton. The most likely possibility is that the latter is the killer based on what the map maker says, but things in Souls games are rarely so simple. Pate has pretty blatantly tried to get Creighton to kill you instead of him by setting you up with his armor set. Although it does appear to be common armor, it has in fact been meticulously customized. To quote his item description for Batum, belong to mild mannered Pate. This has been considerably altered. Perhaps it was pillaged. Is Pate impersonating the real Pate? The belong to mild-mannered Pate part, followed by perhaps it was pillaged, makes me wonder if Mr. Wannabe Pate didn't do the exact same thing as me, as in just take it from someone else. Fume Knight's second phase. I think this is referring to one of two things, the first being him using his big sword exclusively in the second half of the fight is meant to represent his original self being completely lost and letting Nadalia take full control, uh, something which we'll get into a little bit later into the video. Or what's more likely is that if you arrive in his boss room with Velstelt's equipment, he'll go straight into phase two since the two hands of the king had an intense rivalry. Tumble buff. A glitch with a really weird and kind of funny name, it lets you buff weapons which you normally can't buff with sorceries or miracles such as magic weapon or sunlight blade. It doesn't work with item buffs like resins though unfortunately. The Ivory King has 7 pets. 
Although we only see Alva, Lud, and Zalin, it does state in their soul descriptions that the Ivory King actually has seven different pets that represent their own respective duties. Whether they're all big cats, animals, or other things entirely are completely unknown, though. Dark Souls 3 Ring of Favor and Protection Glitch This is a glitch where you can get infinite stamina by repeatedly equipping and unequipping the Ring of Favor and Protection. The glitch works because the Ring of Favor increases the maximum amount of stamina, but also resets the stamina pool back to full in the process when equipping it. Centipede Demon Visible Before Boss before fighting the centipede demon, you can actually see him just chilling out on a wall near the bonfire, just before the demon fire sage. You have no way of harming him before the boss though, even though it does seem like that you hit him if you try to attack him here. Manus Bochis Similar to the entry uh, regarding Sif and the Capra demon that I mentioned before, you can kill Manus before going through the boss fog. If you aim carefully in the area where the fogs are located, you can actually kill them via bow and arrows without having to one step into the arena at all. Dark Souls 2 Nito Shrine Although I'm not 100% sure, I think this is referencing the shrine that you can pray at right after the Demon of Song boss fight. There's also a Milfinito, a being that you encounter a few times around the Shrine of Amana singing beside it, and they make mention of the Great Dead One multiple times, Nito being the most likely person as to who they're talking about. Escaping Seath's First Encounter Something that I only learned about recently, but I wish I knew before I actually played the game. You can leave the first unwinnable boss fight with Seath at any time by simply just walking out of the boss fog like you do when you enter. To my knowledge, this is the only time in the whole franchise where this is possible. New Londo Ghost Babies In New Londo Ruins, there are two types of ghosts that you can encounter. The more common ones use sides to attack. The other doesn't appear to hold a weapon, but just screams loudly, attracting other ghosts to you. These enemies will always be holding a baby in their arms, adding to the already disturbing vibe of the New Londo Ruins. Lord Vessel in Dark Souls 2 In the mansion in Majula, you can find the Lord Vessel from Dark Souls 1 broken in the rubble. It's always been my take that this is here because it's meant to imply that the events of Dark Souls 1 happened ages and ages before the events of Dark Souls 2, and such an important item being little more than trash is like a visual representation of this. The Rotten's Left Arm His arm can be cut off, and if done, you get a Pharos Lockstone as a reward. Some use this to fuel to support the idea that the Rotten is actually Pharos himself. Cut Petrus Introduction From cut voice lines, it seems you were meant to save him from being killed by Pinwheel originally, as he says that he's going to be used as a tool for necromancy. Based on the voice lines, it sounds like this is how you were meant to encounter him originally, rather than meeting him first and him getting kidnapped by Pinwheel later. Perhaps he was meant to be up on that table instead of this random skeleton initially in Pinwheel's intro cutscene. That would have been pretty harrowing. That's everything in Layer 2, and now it's time to dive deeper into Layer 3. Pursuer's Original Concept the pursuer was going to have a more unique role as bosses go, using weapons he finds on the ground around the area depending on where you run into him, instead of having a traditionally set in stone boss move set like he does in the final game. Original Bed of Chaos Fight It was meant to be against the King of Isolith primarily, with the Bed of Chaos being a background element. I imagine it would have probably have been kind of like the old monk from Demon Souls, where you fight like an NPC type enemy with the bed of chaos swiping at you and taking a more active role in the fight than the old monk did. Katarina Armor Inspiration So the armor inspiration for the Onion Knights is actually based on the minor Berserk character Bazuzo's armor, and uh, that went on to inspire the Onion boys and girls that we see in game today. Knight of Thorns Armor Inspiration It turns out it was originally inspired by Tarkus and Bruford's Iron Ring Trial from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Phantom Blood, the first part of the series. You wouldn't think that just by looking at it, but after the dev's explanation in the Dark Souls 1 art book, it totally makes sense, like I definitely get it after reading their explanation. To briefly summarise, the whole Thorns aspect of the armour takes inspiration from the trials that Tarkus and Bruford had to go through to become knights, where they wear large iron rings around them whilst fighting opponents. The Lost Sinner's Hands 
It looks like the lost sinner possibly has two dark signs in the palm of her hands. Every human is meant to have only one, which raises the question as to why she doesn't follow this rule, unless the holes are just the result of torture. Anolondo Spiral Non Backstab uh, This is just basically to say that the backstab mechanic just does not work at all on the big Anolondo Spiral Staircase. It, it, it just doesn't. Don't try. Item Burden still exists. A Demon Souls mechanic where you can only pick up a certain amount of items before becoming over encumbered and not being allowed to pick up anything else. This instead of being removed altogether, actually makes a comeback in Dark Souls 1. They just give you like an item burden of like 999, so you'll probably never become overburdened unless you're purposely trying to be, but it was removed outright in the later games and I'm glad it's gone to be quite honest. Crag Spider's Rare Attack If you stand behind the Crag Spider enemies, they have a very low chance at shooting their eggs at you. As that woman said to her kids. PS3 Miracle Resonance Ring Bugged Honestly, Illusionary Wall explained this in amazing detail and I'd highly recommend checking that video out, but to sum this entry up briefly, essentially these are meant to boost the effectiveness of miracles, visualised by large white circles out in the world. It worked on Xbox 360 and the original release on PC, but not on PS3. Patches would bring it back briefly and then it would become broken and unusable. It does exist in Dark Souls Remastered, although it is extremely rare. Butcher's a female. Yes, every Butcher enemy is specifically meant to be a woman, and that's been confirmed by Miyazaki himself in the same interview that I referenced earlier in the art book. Child Witch Beatrice. Originally, there was meant to be a summon specifically for the child version of Beatrice, the summon who helps you against the Moonlight Butterfly boss. Shame this was cut, as this was obviously a clear-cut reference to, and I can never pronounce her name right, Shirkshi from Berserk. Tarkas didn't die by gravity. People believe that such an accomplished warrior who had to get through Sen's fortress couldn't have just fallen once he reached Anolondo, and was instead assassinated by the Painting Guardians. I think this is the most likely way Tarkas died, but I've also heard a theory that the Iron Golem picked him up and just threw him so hard that he threw him into Anolondo, and that's the explanation for the the broken window. But uh, I personally believe the Painting Guardian's idea because the mental image of him being thrown that far is just kind of really funny. The boulder lever moves on its own. Yep, I'm not sure if this was just a glitch that wasn't fixed or it's meant to be intended, but the mechanism that makes the boulders and sense fortress move elsewhere will just go back to its original position after a while on its own. You can actually watch it happen. It's happened a few times to me across my playthroughs, and I always thought it was just really bizarre. Visiting the town under Firelink. Like the 1-2 town in Demon Souls, I covered that in my Demon Souls iceberg, you should probably watch that if you haven't, you'd probably like it, but self-plug aside, there's actually a large, surprisingly detailed town underneath Firelink Shrine you can explore with hacking tools. It's really cool, I'll link a YouTube video that explores it in, in the description, but I really like the vibe of it, it's kind of cosy in an odd way, like there's big billboards and stuff, there's like a full like town square and a fountain, It's it's nice, it's cosy. World Tendency still exists. A complex mechanic from Demon Souls, it makes a return in Dark Souls 1, but instead of just being an active gameplay mechanic for everyone, it's used specifically as a covenant feature for the Gravelord Servants. Essentially, the longer a Gravelord Servant remains in an invaded world, enemies will become tougher to beat, and even become Red Phantom versions of themselves, like what happens in Black World Tendency in Demon Souls. Drift Items this entry goes back to the Vagrant enemies, as Drift Items is another term for them. Drift Items are unique in the sense that two different versions will drop different items. Evil Drift enemies, which look like little crabs with pincers, will drop humanity, while their Red Phantom variant will drop twin humanities. Good Drift Items, on the other hand, just look like little eggs, and they will drop any of the below items completely at random. There's a few, so I'm going to list them quickly. They'll either drop Prism Stones, Divine Blessings, Lloyd's Talismans, Transient Curses, Purging Stones, Egg Vermifuges, Dung Pies, 
charcoal pine resin, gall pine resin, purple moss clumps, blooming purple moss clumps, the soul of a lost and dead, the large soul of a lost and dead, the soul of a nameless soldier, a large soul of a nameless soldier, large soul of a proud knight, repair powder, dragon scales, any titanite, rubbish, a copper coin, a silver coin, or a gold coin. So pretty much they can drop any consumable item. Giant Skeletons dropping Murakumo. I think this refers to the incredibly low drop rate of this weapon, it's 2% to be exact. Although with 10 humanity, you can up the chances to a grand total of... 4%. Ooh. Vamos dialogue mistake. I think this is in reference to like the sound quality of this voice, which is not a mistake. This man is perfect. Listen to him. Be gone with you. You spoil my focus. How can you call that a mistake? Shame on you. Person who put this entry in the iceberg. How foolish. The ancient dragons were not truly alive. I mean, this is technically true. In the Age of Ancients, it is established that there's just no concept of life or death. With nothing that's targeting their scales, they were never truly alive, and they couldn't die either, so... They were just vibing. The Age of Vibes. Good vibes. And then Gwyn had to be a big knobhead about it. The ending doesn't matter. I think this is referring specifically to the Age of Dark and Dark Souls 1, uh, since that's essentially made non-canon with the existence of Dark Souls 2 and 3. And in Dark Souls 2, it's much less about the end goal and more so what comes after, especially if you go for Aldia's ending. Of course, Dark Souls 3's endings matter a great deal, since it's the end of the franchise and all. The Plot Against the Gods there are many, many theories about the specifics of this, but we know that there was a plot to destroy the gods before our character entered the picture, with it being described as ill-fated. Like the entry about Miracle Resonance Rings, Hawkshaw has an amazing video that goes into this part of Lordran's history in deep detail. But to give a summary, the Black Knights were sent by Gwyn, and allegedly placed in areas that were advantageous to the Rebellion. We already know that the occult items were hidden in Anorlando, since this is what the gods are weakest against, but details range from Havel being broken out and replaced with a decoy, Ricard acting as a double agent, the link between Rhea and Havel, Sigmeyer's family and their connection to the plot, and a big figurehead of the rebellion being the Nameless King and the Nameless Blacksmith deity, who was potentially beheaded and placed in Ash Lake, a meeting point of the rebellion as punishment and as an intimidation tactic. Dusk and Siegland visible in golems. Yeah, you can actually pick out which golem they're trapped in by checking the big crystal on their right shoulder. Dragon shortcut in the painted world. Through some wacky jumping mishaps, you can actually use the pa the reanimated dragon corpse and the path that's on to just practically warp next to Priscilla's arena. I've never tried it myself, but it looks kind of funny. Parrying boars. During their charge attack, I believe that you can actually parry the boar enemies. It doesn't offer a repose though, it just more so kind of shoves them out the way, which I like even more, I think, because it just looks very funny, like these big armoured beasts are running full pelt towards you with these big piercing tusks and you just, just kind of shove them out the way, so no thanks. Busy. Ingwood's original quest. You originally had to prove yourself to Ingwood by killing a particular Dark Wraith before getting the seal key. This could be a souped up version of the normal Dark Wraith enemy, but I think it's probably the undead King Jariel that we talked about earlier in the video. But I think it's interesting that he won't just give you the key by draining the water out of New Londo ruins. You had to really prove yourself in combat that you were ready to take on the Four Kings. The undead prophecy was fabricated by Gwendolyn. A theory that I personally do believe to be true, it is weird how the language used in the prophecy is so different compared to the rest of the game and just how most characters in the series speak generally, and it does align exactly with what Gwendolyn and Frampt would want the Chosen Undead to do, and they do also speak in a very similar way. 
making me believe that these two collaborated together to fabricate this prophecy to get the Chosen and Dead to fulfil what they want. Velka is punishing the gods. She's described as a rogue goddess, and cut content in Dark Souls 1 proves that she would have had some sort of intense rivalry with Gwendolyn, so it's not hard to believe that if she does not get on with Gwendolyn, then that hatred would apply to the rest of the gods. Ariandel is Ariamus. The paintings have always been named after their creators, as far as we know, so with the two being so similar, is the Ariandel we fight Ariamus ages later? having become despondent after ages, or is the painting itself the same place, with the name changing slightly in their own cycles, like how Lothric is, was clearly Lordran at some point? Lap's true identity. Uh, it's Patches? I, I'm not sure why this is on layer 3 of the iceberg, since I think just playing the DLC normally will reveal this. Uh, but there you go. Yeah, you go to the Big Halloween statue thing. You tell Lap. He kicks you down to progress you onward. I think he kicks you down to progress you onward either way, but yeah, it's patches. I think everyone knows that. Again, don't know why it's at layer 3. There you are. Crestfallen Merchant Hollowing. Although it's still alluded to in his existing dialogue, his cut voice lines much more directly portray what the hollowing process does to a person's mind. His dialogue shows very dementia-like symptoms as well. It's genuinely really sad to listen to. I'd recommend searching it up and listening, because it is interesting to see someone hollowing in real time, but it's also really tragic. Velka wants the chosen undead to kill the gods. This is kind of piggybacking off of Hawkshaw's theory that the identity of Velka is the corpse with the sack on its head that we see at the very start of the game. Now, the evidence he brings forth is quite compelling, but it always struck me as a bit weird that this god who clearly the other gods are afraid of to some extent since they hate us so much would die to a demon that, while strong, an undead can kill, so presumably if an undead, granted a skilled undead, can defeat it, a god should have little to no problems. So that makes me think the only way it would kill Velka is if Velka wanted to die, so perhaps maybe that was her way of having a hand in having the chosen undead being broken out of the asylum, or she could just be using the undead in general as unknowing puppets to carry out her rivalry, killing the gods without her having to get directly involved. Rosaria is Guinevere. During Leonard's questline, he kills Rosaria and we must obtain her soul to revive her. It is very strange that the place where we invade to recover her soul is specifically Guinevere's chamber in Anolondo, where we find the illusion of her in Dark Souls 1. Another piece of evidence is that we find Gertrude taught her followers bountiful light, but from Rosaria's soul we can make bountiful sunlight, which is a more powerful version of the spell. They also do look and sit quite similar, so there's that too. The Show Your Humanity Puzzle To progress in the Ring City DLC, you have to use the Young White Branch to turn into a humanity sprite and go near a ladder which will drop down for you. I have no clue how people were supposed to work this out since there's absolutely nothing in game that points towards this being the solution to the puzzle. I, I understand it connects to finding the humanity statue, but still there's nothing really in game to say, yes, going in the swamp specifically and using the young white branch will make you turn into a humanity sprite, you can't just do it anywhere, or that's what you need to do. How, how people found out. That was the answer to the puzzle, beyond me. Gale is a Berserk reference. Yes, I think it's probably the most obvious Berserk reference, with the exception of Artorius, but his fighting style is a clear parallel to Guts's. He uses a large sword, he has a crossbow on his arm, Gale has a normal crossbow, whereas Guts has a crossbow built into his prosthetic arm, and they use their cape for some attacks. Gale's fighting style actually specifically reminds me of Guts in the Berserker armor, not like anything in the Golden Age or when he's fighting without the Berserker armor activated. They are very, very similar in that regard. And I think also the fact they are both completely human. Um, obviously, Gale gets powered up seemingly with the power of the Dark Soul, but he is still just a normal human being, the same as Guts. 
Aldridge kidnapped Anri and Horus. I don't think it was him specifically who did it, seeing he was a, as a big ball of sludge at the time. I don't think he was physically able to. It was probably done by a deacon who took them to be fed to Aldridge, a fate which thankfully they escaped, but a lot of children didn't, leading to their events in the main game and their vendetta and questline. Yuria works for Karth. If killed, she will say, Karth, I have failed thee. Meaning that the Lords of Hollow's ending and Yuri's whole questline was inspired or orchestrated by Karth the entire time, working in the shadows. Seath did the nasty with Guinevere. Did he? I'm not sure why people think this, to be honest. This just comes across as weird, degenerate fanfiction to me. I don't like this. I'm not going to talk about this anymore, it's gross. Seath and Kingsfield. Yes, the character Seath was originally invented for Kingsfield. He's also a large dragon in that game, but obviously they are totally different characters. Seath the Scaleless is just more meant to be a callback more than anything. Go isn't blind. There's a theory that Hawkeye Go just thinks that he's blind, either since he's honor bound or too stupid to take off his helmet. I don't agree with this, and I think this is anti-giant propaganda. Hawkeye Go shows that he is very intelligent and articulate every time you speak with him. I don't think unless he was specifically honor bound by Gwyn to say, no, you're not taking this hat that's actively hurting you off, he would just take it off. Like, man's probably just blind and it doesn't really affect him anymore, so he just keeps the helmet on or it's physically stuck to him with resin and he can't take it off. Be nice to go. I don't like this anti-giant propaganda. Aldir is the person on the Scholar of the First Sin cover art. Now that I think about it, I don't think it's ever actually been stated or really theorised much on who the character on the cover art is meant to be. We never come across a character that looks like this in game, so it potentially could be Aldi's human form, since we never see what he actually looks like, we just see what he looks like now, he's a being that exists between the bonfires. I've heard a couple of people say it might be Vendrick, but I think it looks a bit too different from Vendrick in game, so I think Human Aldia is probably the best option, and it's also the coolest in my opinion. The Rotten is Pharos. I think it's because we see him clearly tinkering with like things. He created the poison statues and the facial expressions look very similar to that on the Pharos Lockstone, potentially linking the two together. Giants had faces. In Dark Souls 2, any giant has a large black hole in place for a face, but this didn't seem to always be the case. You can see one giant corpse that actually does have a face just before the Giant Lord boss. I'm pretty sure this is an earlier design that was left in the final game by mistake, but it is cool that we do get to see officially what they were supposed to look like originally. The Lost Sinner was a pyromancer. I'm not 100% sure if this is the case, but she does have a lot of things that do link her back to Pyromancy. For starters, the Chaos Bug crawling into her in the intro cutscene, we know that Pyromancy was made in part by the Witch of Isolith, so that creature that exists in Lost Isolith crawling into her automatically links her to the creation of Pyromancy. And in New Game Plus, there is two Pyromancers that you do have to fight along with her, so Maybe that's implying that she was formerly one? Who knows? The Portuguese version. I'm pretty sure this has to do with the monument in Majula in Dark Souls 2 reading, the letters are worn beyond recognition. This isn't actually the case in the Portuguese version of the game, and instead it reads, the giants cross the sea, perhaps to return home. Originally the sign was meant to signpost updates and hints on how to access the DLC as far as I'm aware, um, but now obviously that stopped for Dark Souls 2, the sign reads that the letters are worn beyond recognition, but the Portuguese version instead had this little message, which I think is meant to reference the giants want to return home after being captured and enslaved by Vendrick. But I don't know why it's in the Portuguese version specifically and not in any other version of the game. I think that itself is very strange. Vendrick attacked No Man's Wolf. I think this entry is in relation to the description of the Vagrant enemy's bow in this game, which I'll read word for word. The Vagrants were a fierce band of pirates who prowled the seas of Dran Lake's northern coastline. 
They were conquered by a former king who chose to force them into hard labour at No Man's Wharf rather than imprison them. They continue to labour at No Man's Wharf and still fight with deadly proficiency. Of particular note is their long range sea bow. It was once used against monsters at sea, but it will now be put to use against you. Lion Warriors. Probably one of the strangest enemies in the franchise. It's canon that they just randomly showed up in Drand Lake all of a sudden. The only thing that's really known about them is that they're devoted to their god of war for Ram, who we speculated to possibly be the Nameless King in an earlier entry. Walnia's alternative death animation. His normal death animation is him getting sucked into the abyss. However, if you destroy two of his three bracelets and bring his health down without breaking the third one, he will like rise up and fade away instead, having like the death animation of a normal enemy or boss instead of his unique one. Parrying Doxel's Two's Pigs Apparently you can parry the pigs next to the mansion in Medulla. I know each time they kill that they get slightly bigger, and apparently once they get to a certain size you're able to parry some of their attacks. I'm not 100% sure about this, I'm not sure if it's real. I mean I've seen a couple videos on it and it looks genuine enough, but this carries the same energy as parrying rats and Doxel's One to me, which obviously you can't do. But it is funny, Invisible Hollows. An enemy created for Dark Souls 2, specifically in Scholar of the First Sin, they become visible upon approaching them with a torch. When attacked, they become visible as well, taking the form of a naked hollow enemy. The Throne Watcher's Gender This is a surprisingly interesting little rabbit hole. In the English version, it always refers to them with male pronouns, although their design itself is quite feminine or androgynous, and the enemy does seem to use a woman's voice. They don't have any gendered pronouns in the Japanese version of the game, so I guess we just have to go with the English version until told otherwise. Pontiff's Prison Stone Sidestep That sounds like a really bad country club. Anyway, when Pontiff Sullivan is walking sideways, there seems to be a bug in his AI where dropping a prism stone will always make him jump to the side, allowing the player to get a free hit in or a free easy heal during the fight. Ocelot Another massive rabbit hole of cut content, during the Osiris boss fight he was meant to be holding a baby, the mysterious ocelot referred to in his battle. There's even a model of him in game, and when he transitions into his second phase, I'm sure you can guess what happens to the poor little guy, there's even cut voice lines of the baby like screaming, following by lots of horrible squishing sounds. This presumably had to be cut out of the final game for censorship reasons, and fair enough, but I think the censorship made for a more interesting story of the question of whether Ocelot's real or just a figment of Osiris's madness. Attacking Human Nishandra Although it's only possible to attack her with ranged weapons, if you cheat and hit her with a close ranged weapon, she does have actually voiced lines of her laughing and mocking the player before vanishing, and this is interesting because I don't think she says these voice lines if you use a ranged weapon. She'll still laugh, but I don't think she'll comment on it directly, whereas if you hit her with a close range weapon, she will, which is really weird. The White Steel Katana this was a special item that they gave away for Dark Souls 2 many years ago. There were a couple of weapons exclusively given away like this for a very limited time, which is kind of interesting, but they're mostly just variations on items obtainable in the main game, the White Steel Katana included as well. Shalqua acknowledges you as king or queen. I believe they're the only character that will do this when you finish the game without going into New Game Plus, along with the Emerald Herald. Although Shal I always mess up pronouncing their name, Shalkor is consistently portrayed as knowing much more than anyone else in the game, so it doesn't surprise me that she's the one to know this. Still with us? Well now it's time to get into layer 4 of the iceberg. Deacons of the Deep Chandelier is dangling above Aldridge's coffin, were potentially used to store children or people for him to eat, and obviously it will be the deacons who would bring it to Aldridge as a sacrifice. And it's a very grim little detail. Cut fight in the Throne of Want The Throne Watcher and Defender were originally intended to be fought alongside Velstat as a 1 vs 3 fight, and I'm really glad they ended up not doing this, it sounds hellish. Quailana used Undead Rapport on Laurentius 
Laurentius only turns quote-unquote hollow when told about a pyromancy made by Quailana and when she spawns into Blight Town. Surely new pyromancies would give him reason to continue living rather than turn hollow, so some believe that Quailana used an undead rapport to kill undead, or you in particular. Sparing Sif you can, but you'd need to use glitches to skip right to the kiln of the first flame, as sadly there's no way to do this in regular gameplay. Nito's third coffin. An empty coffin placed next to Nito. It may be used for someone that we already know, like Pinwheel, or maybe someone special to Nito who's no longer around. Who knows? Ghost footsteps. In different areas, you have a small chance of hearing random footsteps as background ambience. I like to personally think of it as it's the player character sensing the other undead that have come and gone, or other undead in different worlds that are progressing through in the same area, but it's probably just there just to put a little bit of sense of unease in the player that there's other enemies around that weren't accounted for. Gaping Dragon was in Blight Town. At the bonfire at the bottom of Blight Town, there's a big empty area with a treasure chest. Some believe in the intro animation for the fight, this is where the gaping dragon crawls up from in order to look for some more food. I do personally believe this as it makes sense for there to be a dragon scale where the gaping dragon mainly resided. Hellkite Drake on Aqueduct in promotional material for Dark Souls 1, there's a screenshot of a drake perched above the aqueduct near Firelink Shrine. It seems to look more purple rather than red, so maybe there was meant to be two dragons like in Demon's Souls, or it was redesigned and moved for the final game. Competitive PvP with prize pool. There's not much to say here, although it sounds really odd now, there was briefly a professional scene where people played Dark Souls PvP for money. This didn't last long due to it being extremely unbalanced for this kind of environment. You'd be surprised what games can be played competitively. This is another odd one, but the game Catherine from Atlas of SMT and Persona fame was also played competitively for a limited time. Broken Arch Tree in Ash Lake was Portal to Boletaria. Although Miyazaki has confirmed Demon's Souls, the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, Sekiro and Elden Ring take place in separate continuities, fans still like to try and link them together. Some believe that the giant trees in Ash Lake are roots to each world that can be theoretically be accessed, and the close but broken one is allegedly linked to Boletaria, maybe being the broken archstone specifically now I'm thinking about it. These ideas also link a bit back to Elden Ring's Erd Tree as well a bit, don't they? It's funny how these things kind of go full circle. Killing Calamite without go. You can, although it's extremely hard and you'll need a fuck ton of projectiles. You even get a unique line from go if you'd manage to do this. Try Wings. To quote the creator of the iceberg themselves, Try Wings is a message you can put on the orange soapstone. In the early days, people would try to put it near pits or high walls, implying at some point of the game there was going to be an item that would let you fly. No such item exists, of course, and it's a mystery why wings is available in the messaging options in the final game, as there's not really any winged bosses that have a weakness or anything special to do with its wings either. Blight Town's outdated Firelink model. This is in reference to a visual oddity, that being in Blight Town, if you look up Defiling Shrine, it appears to be using an early beta model of the map instead of the final version. Black Knights were meant to roam. The original intent for the Black Knight enemies were to have them constantly roaming around Lordran, meaning you never knew when one will pop up and you have to overcome it. This wasn't possible due to technical limitations, and thus they were put aside as optional challenges for the most part. Bell Gargoyle Fall should be survivable. Based on the normal height for a fall counting as a death fall being about 16 to 18 feet, the fall from the rooftop to the section with the three hollows near Andre shouldn't be fatal, although I have to imagine it's to do with the area being considered separate. Seath helped in Prison Havel. This wouldn't surprise me considering they're known to be sworn enemies. I haven't found anything that would directly state how Seath contributed to Havel's imprisonment, but unless the Hydra outside of his prison, essentially, is a creation of Seath's, but 
of course he would have a vested interest in getting rid of him. The second gargoyle wounded by Lautrec or Crestfallen Warrior. While it's good for gameplay purposes, it's never explained why the second gargoyle was wounded from a lore perspective. Out the two, I think Lautrec would be the most likely candidate to have damaged the second gargoyle before we encounter it since he's locked up near them. Smo is Aldridge. The only thing that really links these two is the arena that you fight them in and the fact they are both known to have intense, depraved senses of hunger, with Smo grinding his victim's bones into food and Aldridge just straight up eating people. But it does state in an item description in Dark Souls 3 that Smo was one of the last lines of defence for Anolondo, so I doubt Aldridge is him and if anything he died fighting him and his forces. Which Havel is real? Is the one in Dark Souls 1? Or Dark Souls 3 the real one? There's no real way of telling one way or the other, but one interesting theory is that the real Havel is the Dragon Slayer armor boss, it largely being a souped up version of him. You know, heavy armor, similar looking sword to his iconic dragon tooth, and rocking a big shield which would go with him, but I don't think we'll ever know, and I'm pretty sure that that is intentional. Smoldering Lake Origins the Smoldering Lake as we know it was created by Lost Isolith crumbling apart and crashing into Ash Lake, merging the two together. God's Grave This is the name of an area that was cut from the final game of Dark Souls 3. We know it would have resembled the catacomb somewhat, and the top half of the area would be based in a forest, which to me sounds like it could be an early version of Far and Keep. The only thing that points against this is that there are two enemies associated with the area. Osiris, which in the code has been called the Dragon Angel, and a cut boss known as the Mother Dragon that we don't really know much about. Dark Souls 3 Cut Ceremony Mechanic There's a super in-depth video on this by Lance McDonald, but the ceremony mechanic basically would have acted as a portable bonfire, where you would make your own for the most part instead of set bonfires seen in the final game. Hyde was modelled after Anno Londo. I think this is very clear just looking at the area alone, but there are more intricacies that tie the two together. To quote the Souls Law Wikidoc, High's Tower of Flame and the Cathedral of Blue have similar architecture to Anor Londo, but there are differences. It can be inferred that the Hyde area was founded by people with limited knowledge on Anor Londo and the gods. The first example, there are several statues that appear to be Gwyn, but with the head of a bird. The bird head is similar to depictions of Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun. This implies that the architects of Hyde were aware of Gwyn to some extent, but knowledge on him was scarce. As such, Gwyn was animalized, becoming a ferocious beast instead of a human-like god. Number two, the Cathedral of Blue was guarded by a man nearly identical to Dragon Slayer Ornstein, who guarded a cathedral in Anno Londo. It is possible that the people of Hyde had heard tales of a dragon slayer in lion armour guarding a cathedral, and so it became some sort of tradition to have a knight wear this armour, wield a spear, and guard the cathedral. Number three, the blue sentinels serve a similar purpose to the Blades of the Dark Moon, but while the latter covenant were dedicated to protecting the deities of Anolondo, the blue simply punished sinners. This implies that the people of Hyde had heard legends of the Dark Moons, but only knew of their roles as Arbiters. And number four, the Old Knights look similar to the Giant Sentinels. As such, it could be inferred that Hyde was the result of people attempting to recreate Anno Londo, but only with limited knowledge on the original, leading to bizarre inclusions of the Old Dragon Slayer and unusual Gwynesque statues. Fake and Original Veldstadt there's a theory that the Royal Aegis that we encounter in the Undead Crypt is a fake, and the real Veldstadt is in fact the Throne Defender. To sum it up, it is odd that Veldstadt doesn't appear to be hollow, despite being down in the Undead Crypt for so long, and the Throne Defender's sole description states that the Throne of Want needs an appropriate guardian, and who would be better than someone described as Vendrick's right hand? I do personally disagree with this and feel like someone who's clearly a cleric falling and using dark magic is clear representation of him hollowing, especially since we can't really see him behind the armour. The Forlorn want to occupy your body. Their armour set reads, Born of Aldia's obsession with the first sin, the Forlorn lost their corporeal form and a world to call their own. Now they drift into other worlds, ever in search of a home. 
but without self, one has neither beginning nor end, and so the forlorn have only to wander. So, as they don't have a real form of their own, they constantly invade the bearer of the curse with the intent of taking their body for their own. Time is not convoluted. This is actually a mistranslation on the part of Soler's dialogue, and the more accurate translation would be that time is stagnant, which, although it does sound a bit nitpicky and minuscule, it actually does create a lot of different lore implications. The Pendulum of Time a big plot important item in the original story concept of Dark Souls 2. It was meant to be held by a wizard named Veldrick. Not Vendrick, Veldrick. I know the names sound very similar, but they are a little bit different. It didn't move at the start, and the world would be infested with demons over the course of the game. However, with parts of dragons, the player would be able to access holes in time. This is how the Emerald Herald would come to know the player character. You would meet her as a child, and then she would remember you as an adult, from their original encounter. We're truly in the latter half of the iceberg now, so now it's time to get into layer 5. The Fume Knight is dead. Surprisingly, it states in the art book that the Fume Knight went to the Broom Tower to kill Nadalia, but he was beaten, killed, and is now controlled by her spirit, as opposed to him sympathising with her loneliness like I originally thought. Havel is the Stone Dragon. Some believe Havel sneaked away from the eyes of those in power in order to incarnate into the baby stone dragon tucked away at Ash Lake. Do I believe that he's the stone dragon? Honestly, no. I think it's just an ancient dragon that was either hidden or was missed by the gods in the war and has only recently hatched. But, uh, you want to think Havel animorphed? You go for it. Yulia is the undead female merchant. The male undead merchant will often reference someone called Yulia. Some think that it's a dead pet or even as Uchikatana, but some think Yulia is the name of the other merchant who was captured by him and ran away and locked herself behind some bars to get away from him. He's a bit of a creep to be fair, so I, I can't really blame her. Fourth Asylum Demon Reskin Again, to quote the maker of one of the icebergs used for the video, The fourth reskin is a reference to the fact in Priscilla's arena there's an unused stray demon called the Snow Demon. Possibly before Priscilla was repurposed as a boss, he would be the boss of the Painted World. This would have been the fourth time you fight an Asylum Demon reskin in the game. Forest Covenant NPCs are real players. But they're, but they're not though. I don't know what to say to that, they're, they're just not. I don't know if they were based on real players, like characters when testing before the game came out or what, but... Yeah, I don't know what to say to this other than just... Nah. Griggs is a spy sent to kill Logan. He wears the Black Sorcerer set, which is used by secret sorcerers who never reveal themselves according to the item description. He drops the Hush Sorcery when killed, but... Importantly, will never sell it, which is used by other spies in the Dragon School of Vinhelm. And despite being a huge fan of Logan, Logan never once acknowledges his existence. All of these point to the theory that he was sent by the Dragon School to either keep tabs on Logan or kill him. Blight Town Lag is the intended experience. I think the original Lag Blight Town should be classified as a war crime to be honest no one deserves to go through that man speaking of just watch zero lenny's video of uh following the ign guide for dark souls 1 is that where this comes from because that guide also said it was the intended experience it was like the true experience 12 kings boss i believe this refers to the maximum possible amount of kings that can be spawned in that boss fight the Identity of the Crystal Knight Some people think that he could be the one who created the traps in Sen's fortress, although not Sen himself. The most common belief, however, is that this is Idas, who created the crossbow Evelyn, but a more unpopular theory is that this is actually Sen himself. I personally believe that this is Idas, and he's just more of an inventor type character, but I've seen a few compelling arguments for all cases listed. Using Priscilla to level up 
She was meant to be the level up lady of Dark Souls 1, and some cut animations could be what she does to level you, particularly the more detailed animation where she blows ice wind from her hand. That's probably what she would have used to level your character. The primordial crystal was made to help Seath. This would have been only natural, since there wouldn't be easily accessible dragon scales or dragons outright, so Seath would have needed something to help keep his pseudo-immortality in check, which makes it a little bit sad if the dragons made this primordial crystal to help out their clearly ill brethren, and Seath responded by killing them all out of jealousy. It just makes like his actions even more heinous now I think about it. Wolfring found on Chester. In cut content, Karan makes a comment on the Wolfring if the player has it in their inventory. She mentions it was stolen by a man in a long coat. Obviously this is referring to Chester, but the player finds this ring on a nondescript corpse in Darkroot Basin. Could this corpse be Chester, having been killed by Karan? Or is it just one of the enemies around the Royal Wood? Or did the ring just happen there by circumstance? I think it would be really cool if it was Chester in the future and Karan just left his body there and over time the area became inaccessible and that's how the ring stayed there all those years. Centipede Demon's Original Fight The boss was actually originally intended to be fought in the Bell Gargoyles arena as the main roadblock to the first Bell of Awakening. However, the devs felt that he didn't really fit so he was placed into Isolith instead and I think this was definitely the right call. Original Shanalot Design Concept I think this is meant to be in reference to the being the idea of first meeting the Emerald Herald as a child, as the original story concept centred around an evil wizard and using time travel, so I think this is probably referring to just the concept of meeting her as a child and her getting you to remember her as an adult, or the actual design of Child Shanalot, which is significantly different from the final version that we see in the main game. Killing queens will make more fragments. This is more of a theoretical thing. Nishandra, Alana, Alsana, and Nadalia were created from fragments of Manus upon his death in Dark Souls 1. So if the queens are killed, could a larger amount of weaker children of Dark be created from them? I doubt this. Although they came from Manus, I think the only time Children of Dark would be created is only when specifically Manus is killed. I think these just represent different parts of him, and because they aren't the full being of Manus, their deaths wouldn't result in more Children of Dark. Human effigies cure insanity. Yeah, in a way they do. Using human effigies is the way to reverse hollowing in Dark Souls 2. In-game, it's basically used to remind the undead of their humanity, pulling them away from hollowing, i.e. losing themselves to despair and hopelessness. So yes, in a broad sense, this would cure insanity for the undead. The Iron Keep is in the sky. I think this has to do with the semi-popular headcanon that the elevator into the Iron Keep is based in the mountains seen just behind Earthen Peak, and the Iron Keep is situated high up in the mountains, not literally like a floating zone in the sky, but still very high up. I, I guess it's possible, but it does feel like a little bit of a stretch in my opinion anyway. The giant's treasure was knowledge. It's mentioned that Vendrick invaded the lands of the giants at Nishandra's suggestion, in order to pillage a certain treasure. It's never directly stated what exactly the treasure is, but perhaps it's knowledge of soul manipulation, creating golems powered by souls which can be seen just outside of, and inside of, Vendrick's castle. We're truly deep in the darkness now, but we need to go deeper for Layer 6. Godwin's Art Inspiration Something that I noticed recently when I was playing Elden Ring, I think that the Sewer Centipede concept art in Dark Souls 3 could serve as a possible inspiration for Godwin's art in Elden Ring, as the pose they're in and just their general design just look extremely similar. I'll throw up a picture comparing the two. Haunted copy. Oh, there's a, there's a spooky meatball, Mario! Oh, there's a... Dark Souls, but it's got hyper-realistic guys. Effigy Shield Contest Rigged 
There's been a few things across the trilogy that have been designed by fans for winning competitions, the Effigy Shield being one of them, but I don't think anything's actually come out about anything being rigged though. I'm pretty sure this is just a joke entry. True pacifist run. Good luck with that one. <laughs> you think this is Undertale? You know, you, you can't make friends with all the funny skeletons. And the kooky goat monsters. I've never played Undertale. I remember when they added Sans as a me costume in Smash Brothers? That was weird, man. Invading Firelink Shrine. It's one of the few areas in both Dark Souls 1 and 3 where it's completely offline aside from the occasional note. So, apart from that, no invades allowed, as far as I know. The Grass Crush Shield is a placebo. Uh, in the canon of the game, maybe, but it definitely does increase stamina regen in the actual game, like in the mechanics, so I, it's, it's definitely not a placebo. IRL. Reverse boss orders. I, I highly doubt that this is possible without mods in any of these games, even with like stupidly insane glitches. I've never seen anything like this either that's been done without heavily, heavily modding the game, but if anyone can point out any video that tries to do it in reverse order, you know, play all the bosses in reverse order, I please Please post it in the comments, but uh, I don't think it's possible, like, at all. Seven Undiscovered Illusionary Walls This is actually true. All seven of the illusionary walls hide one very important item behind them each. The item, you ask? The, the Seven Chaos, Chaos Emeralds! Emeralds! <laughs> the Pendant Unlocks Second Quest this is true, you also have to name your character Zelda in the menu to get onto the second quest. Epic Gamer Tip Flame God Flan A rarely mentioned character that's only referenced in one item description. It just states that he married Gwyn before the pair left on Orlando. Could he be someone that's later known as Hyde and the Tower of Flame was built in honour of him? Or maybe Flan was their old name before they took on the name of Osiris. I doubt either of these are true, and it's probably just its own character, but this man has literally one sentence worth of lore to go off on. He's only known for banging Guinevere and dipping from Lordran with a... That's kind of Chad behaviour. Ceaseless Discharge is the son of the blacksmith deity and the witch of Isolith. I suppose the head structure of the Ceaseless Discharge and the Skull and Ash Lake look quite similar. Um, this theory was once again proposed by Hawkshaw, but I personally don't believe that this is true. I think his father is the King of Isolith, most likely Jeremiah. Quailana's Real Motives I think these are laid out pretty plainly, to be honest, so I'm not sure why this is as deep down as it is. But the crux of her motives are that she feels too much guilt to really do anything about the state of Isolith and her family, thus helps strengthen the players so they'll put her family out of their misery for her. Seath experimented on Gwendolyn. It would make a lot of sense, both are extremely attuned with magic, Gwendolyn has snakes for legs which is completely unexplained as far as I know, and he's the only person in his family with anything like this to our knowledge, and Snakes are closely related to drakes and dragons in Dark Souls. Gwendolyn and, and the Moonlight Butterfly, which is a creation of Seath's, share the same theme song, which just adds that further connection between the two. The Lost Sinner Awakened the Old Chaos This is a theory that the Lost Sinner was originally from Elium Lois, and like the Witch of Isolith before her, tried to recreate the First Flame, and by accident created the Old Chaos or reawakened it. And as punishment, she was banished to the Lost Bastille by the Ivory King, and her all-seeing eye was stripped from her and given to other priestesses still in the city. Her sin was more or less repeating the same mistakes as the Witch of Isolith from long ago. Drake Blood Knights turned into dragons. This seems to be a belief of theirs, as they believe that by obtaining and consuming dragon blood, they can transcend their own existence. 
This could be an explanation as to what the weird dinosaur looking enemies are in the Sunken King DLC, but I take the view that this is just an unproven belief of theirs and none of their kind have actually turned into dragons. The Ivory King's Gender Identity this theory stems from the ability in the Ivory King's armor set, in that the armor will provide healing upon beating a member of the opposite sex. It'll be much more effective for women, since most enemies encountered in Dark Souls tend to be male, leading to the possibility that the Ivory King could be trans, or pulling a Mulan, being a woman but pretending to be male. Although, Alsana and pretty much all things referencing the Ivory King use exclusively male pronouns, but the magic gender change in coughing exists in Dark Souls 2, so to be honest, who knows? Your character saves Dranlaic twice. Of course, the bearer of the curse saves Dranlaic over the course of the main game, but they also save the land by going back in time and killing the giant lord, being a big part in stopping the invasion, despite the only one remembering this being the giant lord himself, which is why he goes crazy and attacks you as the last giant at the start of the game. I do find it really interesting that the original story concept was this seemingly cyclical nature of going back in time and your actions in the past directly affecting what you can do in the future or what had happened to the world in the future. So I think it's interesting that that part carried all the way to the final product. We're not done quite yet though, so now it's time to get on to layer 7. Vendrick is a king who was never realised as a king. The Dark Souls 2 art book comments on this in Vendrick's section, and I believe this is meant to reference the tragic nature to his rule, that it seems he was always destined to fail and suffer, despite seemingly being a good person with good intentions, although his rule was corrupted by Nishandra's want for power. The Throne of Want gives protagonists what they desire most. The Throne of Want shows a true monarch what they want to see in the end, presumably you choose once within to link the first flame and become Cinder. This is most likely why Nishandra wanted to get to it so desperately, so she can enact her perfect Age of Dark and become the most powerful being, as we know the thing she covets more than anything is power. Specifics as to why old the old Dragon Slayer could be Ornstein or someone else entirely. Now, I've talked about him a little bit throughout this whole iceberg, but I wanted a specific entry talking about why he could be Ornstein or why he could be someone different. One reason as to why we see him use darkness instead of lightning could be that he fought Nishandra or another child of dark to let Guinevere leave, or that he lost track of Guinevere or otherwise lost his purpose, instead becoming hollow, being the same person but now using darkness instead of lightning. This could be a different person entirely, as one common theory, especially in the Japanese community of From Software, is that Ornstein is the Storm Drake in Dark Souls 3, him leaving Anolondo to pursue the Nameless King, as his loyalty lied with him specifically. The Nameless King took him into Archdragon Peak, and through training and meditation, he became the Storm Drake. So the old Dragon Slayer, like a lot of Hyde's Tower of Flame when we discussed that in its own entry, could have read about the stories in Anno Londo and the stories of the four royal guards of Gwyn, so Ornstein being his inspiration, he took on his armour and used a similar fighting style. Or another theory I've seen is that it could be some sort of tradition where the armour is passed down from person to person and because it's been used by humanity so much that the darkness of humanity has now become encased in this armour, so whoever uses it also uses dark magic. Gwendolyn is still alive during the Aldridge boss fight. This is based on some noises that you can hear just before entering Aldridge's boss arena. There's a really good video on this that I'll link in the description, but they used modding tools to enter the actual boss arena without triggering the fight, and it's a lot more clear to hear in that video, but you can hear Gwendolyn moaning in pain, and I think you can hear him muttering like, oh god, just in absolute agony. Which, if that is the case, where we literally just walk in on Aldridge, like, nearly done eating Gwendolyn instead of just using his dead body as a puppet, then that makes the boss fight even more harrowing in my opinion, that, like, we're too late to save Guinevere, like, we walk in and just, they're dead anyway regardless of what we do, but they are still alive and they still feel every hit, every single bit of damage that Aldridge is taking during the course of the boss fight, that just makes it 
even more harrowing and it gives a real like borderline horror game vibe to everything regarding Aldridge and uh, he already had that to be honest with his lore. Like Aldridge is one of the creepiest bosses in the Soul series. We're nearly done but last but not least we're truly at the bottom of the iceberg now at the final layer, layer 8. The divine blessing is Qu is Quinevere's piss. <laughs> no, it's obviously a gamer girl bathwater. Jesus, do you, do you guys not read item descriptions? Do you guys not look into the law? Idiots, the lot of you. That's obviously why it restores you to full HP because it's so goddamn tasty. Like. If it was just piss, then it wouldn't do much, would it? Obviously, it's got to be the bathwater to fully restore your HP. <laughs> Duh. The age of the deep is not real. A theory that I came up with myself, I mentioned it in my Dark Souls 3 analysis, and please watch that if you haven't. I feel like you'll enjoy it if you've gotten this far and like this video, but getting on to the actual entry. I believe that the Age of the Deep isn't real, and it's pieces of Aldridge's fuck psyche made manifest. He seems to be able to conjure things he dreams about into the real world, explaining why he can use the Life Hunt Scythe, so who's to say he can't do that for himself? And the Deep is actually just a representation of his depraved mind, and the more he leans into his twisted desires, the stronger it manifests in the real world, creating the deep dregs we see in game. Yoshka Cut Content Yoshka's outfit, described as a saint set, is available for the player to wear in removed content. According to the item description, Yoshka was originally imprisoned in a dungeon, presumably Irithyll dungeon, and her outfit, originally pure white, was stained ash grey from years of incarceration. Another article of removed content, Gwendolyn's Finger, could be presumably obtained upon defeating Aldrich. It could have originally been given to Yoshka for additional dialogue and a reward, presumably the Dark Moon Ring based on the dialogue in the game files, and according to its item description, she's a crossbreed similar to Priscilla. We see that in her design in the final game, but it would have said concretely that she is a crossbreed, the same species as Priscilla. Dark Souls 3 Karth Concept Art I couldn't actually find any official concept art, like of just Karth specifically, but there is speculation that Karth, or at least the Primordial Serpents, were meant to have a much bigger role in Dark Souls 3, as the first leaked screenshot of Dark Souls 3 shows the dark sign leaking and hanging low in the sky, and though it's very difficult to make out, there appears to be beings looking very similar to Primordial Serpents with wings flying in the sky. So this to me says that in the initial story concept, Karth was meant to have a much bigger role instead of being deceased like he is in the final game. Maybe this entry is meant to imply that the statues we find in the final game of what very much looks like primordial serpents with legs is the concept art of Karth, but I've never found anything that confirms that this is concept art that was scrapped and instead used as environmental design in the final game. And that was the final entry in this massive iceberg on the Dark Souls trilogy. Uh, again, I want to thank um, you all for getting to the end of this video. It's probably been the longest video that I've made to date uh, in terms of research and editing and just making the video as a whole. So uh, I really want to thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, if you did enjoy it, a like and a subscribe would be really great. I'm only a very small channel and I would really like to grow and do sort of more videos like this in a more full-time setting. So only way I can do that is by growing. So liking and subscribing is extremely helpful and commenting as well for the algorithm. Uh, I want to give a huge thank you to all the people who created the iceberg, um, as I said at the start of the video, please um, check out the original icebergs and the original videos that I've referenced all throughout the video, uh, I will link them all in the description, um, and yeah, again, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video, bye bye.